Hi guys, it's June the 2nd and we, I think we're just after 2pm in the afternoon on a relatively sunny winter day here in New Zealand and you're listening to podcast number 42 which is entitled Question and Answer Session. So it's our first question and answer session on this channel. So we've collected a number of questions from members of Ruba's Hermetic Alchemy Forum and also students within the Herdom group. Um, these questions, we, we encourage people to use esoteric aliases, so the questions you will hear will be coming under those aliases. So this first question comes from Arborium. And he asks, what are the top three destructive behaviors that novices and initiates seem to be blind to that cause them to fail out of the Herodom group? Okay, so this is a subject that we talk about a lot because most of the time online, especially in public, we're talking to people who are interested in getting involved in training. And they also want to know most often what they can do to make sure they don't screw up the opportunity they're being given. So there's a lot of discussion about the kinds of things that students who are involved in our training, particularly the inner work training, because it's very different than the lab work training, um, the kinds of things that inherently are problems with novices in training. So this comes from... Uh, 35 years of teaching students in Herodom, hundreds of students that I have either personally trained or that I've overseen the training of by another tutor. And these um, top three problems that cause students to fail are extremely common. And I would say the first one is an inability to communicate properly. In Herodom, unlike most mainstream groups, all new students get uh, a personal tutor. So they're in a one-on-one -on -one tuition relationship. Whereas most popular mainstream groups, you may have tutors that have um, a small collection of students and there's no real regular personal interaction. You're usually given the instruction that you're supposed to take care of in the form of a written document of some kind, and you go off and do what you want with it, and occasionally you have an interaction, an interaction with your tutor. And here it is different. You're expected to communicate with your tutor almost on a weekly basis or even more, and it's not unusual for students to communicate with tutors uh, every day sometimes. Um, so one of the problems that we have with a lot of students is simply their inability to communicate properly. They either go long periods without saying what they're doing so that their tutor has no idea what's going on, whether they're actually doing their work, or whether they've had some kind of problem um, in trying to carry out an instruction which has caused a difficulty in their life or whatever. Um, a lack of written communication, they're not sending enough emails or they're not very good at writing um, their thoughts or detailed instruction properly in, in written format, um, or they simply can't articulate themselves very well. The problem with uh, an, an initiatory training in the inner work is that it is very technically complicated. And so there's a lot of technical language which you have to master. And so you have to learn to communicate with your tutor in terms of that technical language accurately. And that can become a problem. So that's the first thing. At the top of the list is poor communication. And poor communication more often than not comes down to simply not communicating enough. Not talking enough to your tutor so the tutor knows what you're up to and then you end up wasting your tutor's time. The second uh, most difficult issue that we've had to deal with with 
novice students is dishonesty. For whatever reason, they're not providing enough information about what's happening in their lives relative to their training, or when they're carrying out or attempting to carry out instruction on exercises during training, they're not being honest about how they're carrying out those instructions or what their results are. Um, most of inner work instruction requires detailed reports to be written by the student immediately after carrying out an exercise, which describes that exercise in detail and then is sent to the tutor. So the tutor can accurately assess the results that the students achieve. So if they're having problems, the tutor can go, oh, okay, so he's not doing that there and he's doing too much of this here and he can help the student adjust his um, approach to the particular exercise and correct his um, faulty behaviour in order to improve his technique. But if the student's not being honest in the reports or simply in conversations with the teacher he's not being honest, then it makes it extremely hard for the teacher to accurately assess where the student's at and what needs to be done in order to um, help the student adjust their, their approach, their method or technique to the work. So dishonesty can become a real problem. And of course, there are extreme cases of things like people being dishonest about recreational use of drugs that is causing a problem. And I don't mean to uh, suggest by that that Herodom necessarily has a problem with students using recreational drugs while in training. But if the use of recre recreational drugs affects training negatively, then the student needs to be honest about it. You can't progress if you're doing something which is interfering with your progression. Something has to be done about that. So, yeah, the most extreme cases of dishonesty usually have to do with something that's going on in the student's life, which is making a mess of their training and stopping their forward progress, and they're not being honest about it to their tutor. So the next thing is the tutor's getting all confused about what's happening to this guy, why isn't X thing working properly, and eventually suddenly you find out, ah, it's because for six months he hasn't been honest about the fact that he's homeless or that he has a partner who doesn't like him being involved in training or that he's illiterate or something like that. So that's the second, uh, probably the second most widely spread problem is dishonesty. And I would say the third most common problem that we have with novice students which causes them to fail is uh, their lack of understanding about what training actually is, what it involves. Um, people, everyone's like, I want knowledge in conversation with the higher genius, or I want to attain illumination. I want the extreme goals of spiritual self-development. But they really have no idea what any of these things are, and they have less idea about what's required to get to that place. Um, so I have spent a lot of time online in the last seven years, I think, that I've been running the forum, um, describing in great detail exactly what happens to people who are involved in inner work training. Lab's com completely different because lab is more of a uh, technical and mechanical uh, process. So it's simply buy this glassware and do these things with it and uh, um, learn to manipulate these particular chemicals here. It's, very, it's like cooking. It's a simple recipe type instruction. And you're either doing the thing or you're not doing it. And if you're not doing it, then you're no longer a student. Um, but in the inner work, there is a serious problem with a lot of students, and it usually affects their training very early on, where they all of a sudden realise what's going on and what training requires of them, and they're all of a sudden going, I actually don't want to be doing this. 
this is not what I thought it was, or they simply decide this is not what initiation is, and they start, they either just straight out walk off, they just leave training, which is not very common, but more commonly they start misbehaving in various kinds of ways in order to cover up their anxiety about the fact that they are now starting to understand what training really is, and then it causes all kinds of hassles with the tutor trying to figure out what's going on because they may not be being dishonest about it, the student, or that these side issues are affecting the training in some kind of a way because the student, the student's keeping his anxiety about what is required on the path to himself mm. instead of just coming straight out. Yeah, so... Yeah, it kind of leads itself back to the third issue then becomes, shows itself through people, students doing, being dishonest yeah. and reducing communication. Yeah. So you can tell tell sign for a tutor. Almost in every case when a, when a student stops, if they start off communicating well and that changes and the communication becomes a problem, you can almost 99% of the time guarantee that there's a problem with them freaking out about what training really is, and at the same time they're being dishonest about it. So usually all thing, all three things go together hand in hand. And when we talk about um, not really understanding what training is, I mean, it seems like it shows in a couple ways. And one, which is it's things are expected of them that of the student that they weren't expecting. Yep. And the other was that it's they had an idea in their mind of a particular kind of experience. Yep. Which usually comes somewhere from mainstream occultism mm -hmm. because of books that they've read or groups that they've previously been involved in. They, they've got a snapshot in their head about what training is. Then they get involved in Herodim's training, which is a very different situation. Um, and it's like, what is going on here? I, and they, instead of attending to the instruction properly, they're spending all their time trying to figure out what's going on? What's all this about? This is not at all what I expected. And so everything becomes a mess. So it is important to understand what it is you're getting yourself into in the beginning, which is one of the reasons why we're now slowly instituting an entry-level training into Herodim's work that will describe what serious training is all about. Help people make an informed decision about whether to go forward or whether to walk away and forget about it. So Veritatum asks, what were the reasons that the Western Hermetic tradition fell into such a fragmented and degraded state? There seems to be a number of factors over history. Okay, so this is really in reference to um, a situation that I first described in my first book, The Hermes Paradigm, First Principles. And as far as I know, it's not something which is thought about or discussed or presented anywhere else in the popular level of Hermetic tradition. Uh, uh, and this situation is that at the end, roughly at the end of the 17th century into the 18th century, something happened to the Western mystery tradition which caused its authentic level to quickly go underground. Um, and that means, for, for our purposes, uh, general hermetic teaching as well as alchemical knowledge. Because one of the things, and we know this happened because um, when we move into the 1950s and the 1960s, there was virtually no alchemical training anywhere in the Western esoteric world. And it took Frada Albertus from the early 60s to found his own school and then start teaching laboratory alchemy to anybody in the public who wanted to attend 
for the Western mystery tradition to suddenly get a slap in the face about what lab alchemy was really about. Because up until that time, since the beginning of the 18th century, um, all kinds of weird theories about laboratory alchemy were being bandied around. And the most popular theory was that all it really was was a kind of weird psychology wrapped up in chemical language as a sort of a code. And most people believe that chemical alchemy was really a farce, that anybody who tried to apply alchemical knowledge in the lab was getting it all wrong because it was really a secret internal tradition that was being encoded in chemical language. But Frater Albertus showed that that was not the case at all, that the lab tradition was authentic. So we do know because of this kind of thing that at the end of the 1600s, up until um, the early 1800s, something happened in the Western tradition to cause the lab stream and general hermetism to, go, to almost disappear so that nobody really knew what those things were. And we know that from before the early 1600s, there was an authentic tradition, simply on the documentation that was left to us and through things like um, the Rosicrucian manifestos are a very good example that there, are, there were people before the manifestos who had access to the authentic tradition. So what was it that caused that underground thing to happen where the tradition virtually died off and then had to be recreated again in the 1800s by people like Elephas Levi and the Golden Dawn tradition, Beverly Pascal Randolph and people like that. And I think personally that there were two major influences there. Uh, one of them was the age of reason or the age or the enlightenment, uh, which caused people to start thinking more in the direction of modern science and to start establishing the first principles of modern science, which then kind of killed off the idea of things like laboratory alchemy. And the other thing that happened around the same time was that individuals who were seeing uh, modern, modern science starting to develop um, killed off the esoteric circles that they moved in and the esoteric organisations and left very few people holding in their hands the like keys to the Western mystery tradition, I think. Um, so I think it was largely the Enlightenment that caused that problem and also an attempt sort of at the beginning, well, at, in the middle towards the end of the 1700s, of people trying to um, recreate the Western mystery tradition from the ashes of the old tradition and making the whole thing very public. There's a lot of evidence around the time of the early 1800s of people like Levi publishing books, starting up so-called esoteric organisations and Freemasonry taking over a lot of that, which created what I call the beginning of the popular or mainstream tradition. And I think a lot of authentic occultists, when they saw that happening, they went further underground because they didn't want anything to do with this attempt at uh, recreating what was the old mysteries because the recreation was a mess and to a certain degree it was embarrassing also because it was making claims that it couldn't produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say the main thing that caused that effect was people like Robert Boyle and the Royal Society and Newton um, who were m making that switch from medieval science and alchemy over to the beginnings of modern science, largely. You think that would possibly suggest something about their level of understanding that they actually had if they were willing to jump ship so yeah well now we know that people like Boyle 
and Newton were both involved in occultism and in laboratory, laboratory alchemy. But if they knew how to um, produce transmutation agents, they wouldn't have been so quick to be trying to find ways to say that stuff is garbage, it's the product of misguided primitive humanity or whatever their reasoning at the time was. So they were still being influenced by the very tail end of the old tradition, which had already lost the keys, um, while at the same time trying to struggle to build a whole new view of how to investigate the nature of reality. And they must not have really had the keys. Like, no argument that Newton was a very brilliant man, but he wasn't obviously brilliant enough to figure out how to make a transmutation agent, whereas the people before him did know, which is an unusual conundrum, really, because there is no argument that he was a brilliant man. So what was he lacking at his time that stopped him from realising the accomplishments of people who went before him in the old tradition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting aspect of history that probably isn't dug into too much. Is it's like, well, how, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Yeah. This doesn't seem to... There are a couple of books that kind of cover that whole thing, but most of it's done from the point of view of the emergence of modern science, not from the slow disappearance of the Hermetic tradition at that time, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why I say that as far as I know, at least in our time, I'm the first person to have brought up this concept that the Western tradition actually just about disappeared at, at one time for 200 years and then had to be reinvented. Whereas most popular occultists now believe that groups like the Golden Dawn, Builders of the Odiatum, the Ancient and Mystical Order, Rose Acre, that all these are continuations of the original authentic tradition when obviously they aren't, which is a whole An another story. lineage, yeah, allegedly. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't really exist. Yeah. Next question comes from Service, and he asks, Your history in the study and practice of hypnotherapy and psychology has led you to be able to guide others towards initiation to achieve knowledge and conversation with your higher genius and more. Would you say that you are self-initiated? Or were you initiated by an adept who has gone through the initiation process? So this whole issue is something I've talked about a couple of times in the past, but never publicly, as far as I can remember. Um, but it's something that gets asked because I make a big deal about the idea that there is no such thing as self-initiation. And I often describe that... Uh, attempt at initiation or belief system that self-initiation exists, I often describe it as being like trying to perform brain surgery on yourself. You simply couldn't do it because the things that are required to get inside your skull and muck around with your brain automatically uh, remove you from the possibility of being able to carry out the task in the first place, like anaesthetic for a start. You can't be under anaesthetic and cut your head open and muck around with your brain at the same time. And initiation is the same. Initiation is a form of psychological surgery where you enter into your own psyche and you change the structure and function of the normal, natural way in which your mind operates. And you can't do that alone because of what that process requires. So I think service is probably saying, well, uh, if you're the guy who put together the system, where did you get the information from? Somebody must have taught you, or you must be self-initiated. Or making it up. Or making it up, yeah. Fair question. Um, so the first thing to understand is that my situation is definitely different from most other people's, because in order to put together a system like Heronim's, somebody had to do it for the first time, at least in our 
time because systems definitely have existed in the West and further back in the Western lineage in the Near East uh, where the same kinds of things that Herodim does were used in the past and in the ancient past. There are very good reasons to believe that the method that we use in in a work initiation was used in ancient cultures of initiation as well. So uh, if those things weren't operating in the West in our time now, in modern day, how did I get my hand on them? And the answer to that is actually very simple, and that is uh, based on the primary reason for being involved in initiation in the first place, which is to attain knowledge and conversation with the higher genius. And we want to do that because the higher genius has complete control over our reality. It not only controls our reality, but it creates it on a moment-by-moment basis. Everything we see outside of us, everything that happens to us, all the opportunities that come to us in our lives, all the things that are not allowed to to be part of our lives are all controlled by our higher genius. So if this is true, the simple reason tells us that that's a good dude to get in contact with to find out the best way of dealing with our life, how to make ourselves happy and productive. Um, And because this is the goal of hermetic initiation, if the situation actually exists, then something happened to me that doesn't happen to most other people. And that is that circumstances in my early life before I got involved in conscious and deliberate study of Western Hermetism were arranged in such a way to make it possible for me to have the mental capability and the skills, the manual skills, to go about putting together a system like Herodim and its training. While at the same time, my higher genius, treating my life like a chess game and arranging all the pieces on the board in such a way that I would come into contact with people who could provide me with the skills I required in order to create, beta test and prove that the system that I put together actually worked. Um, And that when those people with those skills that I required turned up in my life, I would recognize them as something that uh, appealed to me or that I needed, and I would do something about it, do what is necessary in order to succeed in those things. So I can say that I had a number of teachers, but only one of them was an adept. And that person is not physically alive today. The other people that uh, gave me the education that I required in order to learn laboratory alchemy and in order to learn the techniques of the inner work were just normal people who possessed those skills themselves without necessarily being adept or even involved in occult training. So the woman, for example, who taught me uh, the inner work, she was very good at what she do, what she did, and she had all of the bits and pieces that were required to build an esoteric system, but she had no idea about those things herself. But as soon as I saw what she was teaching, I immediately recognised this stuff can be used to build a proper Western-style esoteric initiatory system. That connection was organised between me and her by something I have no control over. Uh, A situation which in Herodin we call a higher functioning intelligence. And the same thing happened when I met my lab teacher, She, of course, was involved in the esoteric community, but I wouldn't necessarily call her an adept. But she possessed all the knowledge and skills that I required 
that once I learned what she taught me, then I could develop it beyond what she already understood. So no, I was not self-initiated. That's impossible. You can't initiate yourself. A non-physical, at least one non-physical, higher functioning intelligence that was adept and is obviously part of the lineage that the Western tradition developed out of, made sure that I got the physical skills that would normally have been passed on to me by an adept, a physical adept like him, from other people. That's how it worked in my case. And now what happens in a system like Heredim is that I, when I teach somebody else, I fulfill all those roles for them. They don't need somebody outside of the system to teach them those skills because I already have all of those, and it's the same with the other tutors in Heredim as well. Yeah, in some ways it's helped. That allows students to come in without having to have that extensive That's history right. of study in psychology and hypnotherapy and lab alchemy and, and things all, like that. And all the situations that were necessary in my childhood to put me in a right state of mind and in the right circumstances in order to do what I had to do. Things can be different for other people. And I can shorten the length of time that it takes a novice to learn all those things now that I've walked the long walk. And it's you know important to stress in this that part of the Heritum system is that we're not trying to convince anybody of anything. Yep. We're just giving you skills and a tool set in order to discover it for yourself and make up your own mind. So in, in some ways if there's any one of the important things about, about it, yeah, people will say prove it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't heard it for a long time, but there, there was a time early on when I was teaching Heritage System to, to people, prove that it's that you're capable of doing these things. Well, sure, start training, and if you follow my instructions exactly, without arguing, without messing with the instructions you will come to the same position of, and realisation that I did. There's the proof. Take it yourself. I can't perform something for you that I have gained that will prove to you that what I'm saying is wrong, uh, is, is correct, except to teach you. The proof is there, and I often offer it to almost anybody, almost anybody, um, to prove it for themselves, but very few people take up the challenge of doing that. And like I say, it's a long time since somebody has actually said that. And like you say, it's important to understand that we're not trying to convince anybody of anything. I don't care whether you believe yeah. what I say or not. Because I know that people who need what Heredim offers will recognise what it is that we're offering and they'll want it. And they'll succeed in it. The rest of the people, it doesn't matter. People who argue against it, who disbelieve in it, or who just simply are not interested in this kind of a thing, will fail or they'll just simply have nothing to do with it anyway. So they don't even come into the equation. Yeah. I think part of it is that the, I guess you could say the, like, Herodom's moral in air quotes, foundation is different from other yep. groups where our goal isn't to get necessarily thousands of students paying dues and doing all these things and grow, grow into a big thing with big flash temples and all I, this kind of stuff. I replied to an email last night to a guy who's in our beta test of our entry-level training because one of the things that he said was, he made a statement to the effect of my wanting to present Herodim's view of hermetism to the world. And I said to him, that's not correct. I've no intention or no desire to, to 
present Herodom's worldview and its system and techniques and its knowledge to the world. That would be completely pointless because 99.999% of the people alive on the planet right now have absolutely no interest in occultism for a start. Mm. Most of them also have no interest in anything spiritual. There is a very tiny, tiny group of people who are interested enough in hermetism that they would look at something like Herodim and think that's worth investigating. And all we're interested in is that tiny, tiny group of people. But in order to get their attention, we got to, like I said to him, we have to spread our net widely, and it means that we catch a lot of fish that shouldn't be in the net. Yeah. Unfortun it's just an unfortunate aspect mm -hmm. of it. More of the impact on that student's life was, you know, the goal for them might not have necessarily been to succeed yeah. in trading. But it Definitely everybody who gets involved in Herodim, especially in a work training, they're not there for no reason if they fail. There's something that they got out of it that they required because there are no mistakes. Um, and for us, it's not important what it is that they required or got out of the system. All that is our concern to those people who succeed in it and want to stay involved in the tradition, in our tradition. Uh, because of their success. That's all our interest is. Those people who fail, well, you know, good on you for trying, and I mean that sincerely, but whatever you're now going to go off and do with your life because of that long-term failure, not succeeding in the long term, mm -hmm. um, that's your issue. It's not ours. Yeah. Del Armias writes... Did the old adepts have a specific reason for using words such as star, astral, celestial, sidereal and sidereal universe when discussing the inner world? Uh, that comes from... Uh, the best place to look for an answer to that question is in Paracelsus because he's the only guy I know who um, described that situation clearly in Really what we're asking about here is what is the meaning of astronomy or astrology in Hermetism. And uh, Paracelsus was very careful to say when it comes to Hermetism, it's not astrology, which is the issue, it's astronomy. And an astronomical view of reality. Uh, where, where astrological type concepts are brought up in texts. And what Paracelsus says about all that is that, um, not in all cases, but in a good portion of cases, astrological, what we normally today consider to be astrological terminology and concepts, actually refer to the mind. He says there are two heavens. One of them is up in the sky where there are planets and everything floating around and the other heaven or firmament is the mind. Of course, he doesn't use the word mind because it didn't exist back then, but it's quite obvious from um, his statements about the subject that that's what he's referring to. And what he's saying is that when we get into the discussion of these kinds of concepts which seem astrological, that we're actually entering the realm of internal mechanics of the inner work. And that's what the old adepts were actually referring to when they used terms like sidereal and celestial and astral. They all refer to stars and to the cosmos outside of the atmosphere of the, of the Earth. And that in most cases, but not all, those references were adept kind of encoded language for an internal inner work tradition. So he also asks then, um, I remember reading in the Hermetic Alchemy essay on astronomy that the original meaning of heaven's sidereal universe firmament were referring to the inner universe and not the outer. Uh, yeah. See? Which then leads to the question, is that what the sidereal or esoteric, esoteric universe looks like 
like a sky of stars. Yeah, so what, what he's asking is, did they call the mind or the internal environment a side real universe because when you look into that environment, does it look like a night sky? And the answer simply is no, it's not. It's an allegory or a metaphor. Um, and probably today, one of the most common examples of using astrology as a metaphor for psychology uh, is uh, an axiom that Alistair Crowley used to use, that every man and every woman is a star. And then he goes on to describe that that's the case because we all have our own fates and our orbits and our destined paths and uh, length of existence and so on and so forth, however the quote goes. Badly ruining, ruining Alistair Crowley's uh, original oh, no. <laughs> meaning here. God knows what will happen to me now. Um, so... It's quite obvious when Crowley said every man and every woman is a star that he didn't literally mean every man and every woman is a burning ball of fire in the middle of a solar system whizzing through space. It's an allegory. And he's using astronomical language to metaphorically describe a condition that exists in the mind. That Planets, moons, stars have intelligence in the same way that we have intelligences inside of us, subpersonalities or intelligences in our own mind that govern our own fate and our own function and structure. This question comes from Draco, who asks, In your 10th podcast on temporal reality, you described a curious relationship that exists between Rurik and Nefesh, which creates the world around us. How does that hypnotic creation of reality, the mechanics of the relationship between Rurik and Nefesh, play a role in initiation or spiritual development? Okay, so the idea that I presented in the 10th podcast, which was called Temporal Reality or temp Temporal Mechanics or something, that's a great one, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a bit controversial, and as far as I know, it's an idea that no one else has presented. Uh, the basis of it is that we live in a virtual reality, which everybody listening to this probably is aware of that concept and that people believe that we could possibly be in a virtual reality. <clears throat> but most of those belief systems... Um, most of the philosophy about virtual reality that I'm aware of works on the idea that this is digital, that it's actually a computer that we're inside of, and that somewhere in the universe, or outside of the universe, or whatever, there is actually a massive technological system that we somehow are living inside of a virtual reality of, and that it's nuts and bolts and circuit boards that are behind the whole thing. My argument is that's not true, that there are actual things about human psychology which can easily be proved and are regularly demonstrated that will show that the, the, the nature of this reality is virtual and that it's virtual in a psychological manner. So then we need to understand that a system like the Hebrew Kabbalah, we have to be aware that it wasn't theirs in the beginning, that they took it from somewhere else, probably from Egypt or Babylon or Sumer and that the root system that they took was a form of esoteric psychology that in Hebrew Kabbalah they call the Partsufim theory. And it talks about the primary psychological archetypes which make up the mind and how they function. So for thousands of years, 
uh, Kabbalistic initiates and people like the Sumerian priestcraft and the Egyptian priestcraft, they knew about the system, they knew about these archetypes, and they learned an enormous amount about how these archetypes function and their relationship to us. That's the first thing we need to understand, that these are facts that can be proven and that they are the kind of root system at the back of what is commonly understood as Kabbalah today. So these dudes who knew all this stuff, who knew about the Partsufim theory, one of the things that they knew was that there was a weird relationship between the archetype that the Hebrews call the Ruach and the archetype known as the Nefesh, which are two of the main faculties that make up our lower psychology. So uh, what, they, uh, what they learned about the Ruach and the Nefesh is that there is a constant conversation going on between the two of them and that that conversation actually creates the reality that we live in. In modern psychology, modern language, that process is what's called hypnosis. And we know because the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Egyptians and the Sumerians understood what the Ruach and the Nefesh were, they also must have known what hypnosis was as well. And one of the things that they would have known about the Ruach and the Nefesh and about what we today call hypnosis is that it creates our reality. That when we're small children, our parents and our siblings program us with this reality because we're in a highly suggestive state and that we enter into the agreement that we call this world because of that early childhood programming. That can be proved as well, and it's not difficult. So the question that Draco is asking is about that theory that I put forward. Yes, we live in a virtual reality, but it is a psychological virtual reality, not a technological one, mechanical one, and that it is based on hypnotic suggestion. Um, and she's saying, what is the relationship between that theory and initiation? And there is a relationship. When the ancient Sumerians, Egyptians, or whoever it was, first discovered the system and investigated it, and build up a body of knowledge about it, they learned what faculties nature endowed Ruach and Nefesh and that hypnotic loop process with that creates our reality and where it's heading, that there's actually a plan for it. And it's heading in a specific direction. And today we call that direction initiation, knowledge and conversation with the higher genius, and eventually illumination. Once the ancient adepts discovered that that situation naturally occurred in the mind, then they next realised that it was possible to affect that conversational loop between the Ruach and the Fesh and inject information into it and alter the human condition in order to achieve initiation. And that's a very important concept and a, a key piece of information to try and wrap your head around. That at some point in history, people were looking into the mind, looked at those particular cogs on the psychological machinery, realised what they were doing, and then realised that they can affect those cogs using their own system against them, more or less. And by that means, effect initiation, make initiation possible. And that's then the next step from that is designing initiatory systems which affect the mechanism of hypnosis that, it, that exists between Ruach and Avesh. Complicated technical concept, but worth playing this bit of the uh, podcast over and over again with until you grasp what it is I actually just said. And right there is the foundation of what we 
today might call the inner work side of the authentic Western Hermetic mystery tradition. Yeah, it reminds me of an aspect of initiation that I think is not discussed often or really much at all, which is the part which you just mentioned of tweaking the part of your psychology that is inherent in being human in a way that supports initiation, that it doesn't have anything to do with you and your mommy or daddy issues or whatever. It's actually just something that all people have as a result of that programming that you mentioned that needs to be ingested in order for initiation to be successful. That it's a natural process that's inherent in everybody. And therefore, we can uh, uh, extract from that understanding that nature intended initiation. It wasn't something that some guy tinkering in his shed invented one day. And it's not something that the people who tried to reinvent the Western mystery tradition in the 1800s, they didn't just invent these things. Oh, let's build a system that does blah, blah, blah. In order for initiation to work properly, it has to follow the inherent natural laws that exist inside all of us that allow for initiation to be a possibility and allow for it to work. And it's subject to the same alchemical laws as yeah. everything else. Yeah. Same natural laws. Yeah. Vincentius asks... Once a person successfully carries out what their highest, higher genius has instructed them to accomplish, does the HG direct that person to a new and different task? Understanding that any given task could take a lifetime to complete. Okay, so the basis of this question is the primary motive behind initiation, which is knowledge and conversation with the higher genius. Maybe Levi... Uh, mentioned the same concept, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but certainly the Golden Dawn popularised the idea that knowledge and conversation was the summit of initiation. Um, and, the, and they also made popular the reasoning behind that, which is if your higher genius is creating your entire reality and governs your entire reality, and that's a good idea to get in contact with your higher genius in order to find out how to be productive, especially spiritually. Um, so uh, traditionally, knowledge and conversation with the higher genius is carried out in order to learn your true will. That's how most Western Hermetists today would explain that situation. We all want to learn our true will. And so he's asking, is your true will a single task or a series of tasks that your higher genius tells you to perform in your life? And the answer is simple, really. There is no list of tasks and there is in a way no single task all there really is is a choice of whether you want to be part of a task that already exists as part of human evolution or whether you don't want to be involved in that if you want to be involved in aiding human evolution then uh, because of your inherent skills, uh, body of knowledge that you've accumulated, and your level of understanding and personal development, then you can slot into that plan. You have a niche in that plan somewhere and then can find yourself like a member, like somebody who's become an employee in a big company, um, moving your way up through the hierarchy of employees, 
through promotion or staying where you are because that's what you prefer. And in general, no matter what task you're performing in the company, you are adding to the life of that company and helping maintain its existence. That's essentially what you're doing, especially from the top down. Mm -hmm. When the top down, when the board of directors and the CEO of the company are looking down the ladder at everybody on the different rungs of the company's employees, all that, they're not seeing so much a product that is made and sold. They're looking at people stoking the fires that keep the company alive and producing cash. And in a way, uh, the task of aiding in human evolution is the same thing. So it's not like there's a list of jobs that need to be done, although in a way there kind of is, but it's not like that when you become part of it. It's more about you, how deeply you're being involved in your own personal development and where that fits into the bigger plan because the two things become one thing at a certain point. Your personal development aids in the evolution of humanity at a certain point. And so whatever's required of you personally in your spiritual evolution then becomes um, a requirement in the collective concerns of humanity. Well, in a way, too, that because your life has been orchestrated in a way for you to have certain kinds of experiences and gain certain skills and yep. so forth. There's a particular kind of job that's sort of waiting for you yeah. at the end of it. It's, yeah. Not everybody can be the CEO and not everybody can be the manager of the paint department or whatever. Some people just want to be the guy in the postal um, service area of the company or, or whatever. The and mail room. <laughs> yeah, the mail room. That's that's the term I was looking for. Um, because that's what they want, and that's what they're best at, and that's what they're capable. That's the role that they're capable of fulfilling. A guy, the guy who sponsored me into Freemasonry, once said to me in reference to uh, the different kinds of people that get involved in occultism and the fact that there are a lot of people who are, how do we put it? Um, of not quite evolved intelligence as other people, that when we think about that situation relative to the ancient mysteries, that every temple needs somebody to sweep the floors. Yeah. And so the person who sweeps the floor is just as important in some ways as the guy who's painting all the secret symbols on the walls and the dudes who are lifting the stone blocks to put the roof on the temple and the guys who carry out the daily prayers in the sanctuary, they all are part of the same system and are all required to make the thing work. And our last question comes from the forum by a subscriber who asked simply to be referred to as the Mexican. <laughs> and the a Mexican good, asks... A good, a, good, a good movie with Brad Pitt. Yes. <laughs> the Mexican asks... When we talk about the work of Saturn, we understand that it is a, quote, vegetable work because it is the product of the organic synthesis of distilled vinegar or acetic acid, a product of the vegetable kingdom, acting on the mineral and impregnating its energies. Analyzing most of the components in a very generalized aspect, we always keep ourselves with the basic elements for life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, plus whatever metal we use. Following this, would it be possible to replace the salt principle with another volatile salt, not necessarily lead, for example, a potassium carbonate, chloride, or a calcium? There should be no incompatibility between these salts because they are present in both the vegetable and mineral kingdoms and are one and the same elements. Okay, so I think probably for most people this is a really technical question, so I'm not going to go on and on about the technical issues here. Um, first of all, I can't answer the question definitely because I haven't experimented with using other volatile salts. All I can say is that 
there are small traditions which argue for the use of specific other salts, such as, for example, using a combination of the calxes of iron and copper instead of lead, for example, in the Opus Saturni. And there is also another small tradition that says any mineral or metal salt should be able to work. So there certainly is a written theoretical support for that concept, yes. Whether they work in practice or not, I can't answer. Um, all I can say is that my focus has been on the use of lead because there is a lot of historic support for the use of that metal in what's called the vegetable work. And that um, that particular metal was picked because of its properties and because those properties made it an easy candidate to work with. And I don't think it was selected because nothing else works. Other volatile salts don't work. I think it was simply picked because it was, after a long history of mucking about and practicing with different metals and minerals, it was discovered that lead was the easiest thing to operate with, so it became the pet substance to be used. So I'm willing to entertain the possibility that other metals can be used to complete the work. And certainly there are other approaches to making the Philosopher's Stone outside of the acetate path which speak of using other metals such as mercury. So I think it's highly likely that other metals do work particularly since the metals themselves are probably not what cause the transmutation effect uh, as far as the volatile salt is concerned uh, and lead in the Opus Saturni. It simply acts as a vehicle for transporting, let's say, the agent that does cause the transmutation effect. So as of yet, the importance of the choice of that metallic or mineral salt in acting as the transport agent for the thing that causes transmutation, <clears throat> it's too much of a complicated and rarefied uh, issue to even begin to try and nut out because we just simply don't know enough about any of this stuff yet. And there's a lot of research to still be done, especially on the far end of the whole subject. Well, thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. I'm sure everyone will appreciate your insightful answers. And do you have any final uh, parting comments that you would like to make? So... Uh, this particular podcast was really just an experiment for us to try out the new gear that we're using to make podcasts and to make videos for Heredom Instruction. And we decided to use the question and answer format because that's also something different that we would like to do again in the future because I know that, that a lot of people find it useful when questions are brought up and discussed that they wouldn't have thought of themselves. Uh, so lastly, as we finish up this podcast, starting with podcast number 43, I will be discussing uh, in the next series the what's called the altar diagrams out of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn Ceremonial Initiation System. And Podcast 43 will therefore be an introduction to that subject, and I'm where I explain 
why I am talking about the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, what my attitude about that system is, and why it is important to be talking about the altar diagrams themselves. So if you've got to the end of this podcast and you're still watching, thanks for watching as usual, and we'll see you again in the next podcast, hopefully.